welcome. You are watching Business Today TV. I'm Sakshi Patra and this is BTS that's behind the scenes, a show where we share a sneak peek into the latest edition of the Business Today magazine with all our viewers. Joining in on this special edition with me are Anand Adhikari, managing editor of Business Today magazine. Also joining in is Krishna Gopalan, executive editor of the Business Today magazine, and with me is also Nidhi Singhal, senior editor of the magazine. And welcome to all of you and thank you so much for taking the time out for this discussion. And now to showcase the first glimpse of this edition to all our viewers. This is what the edition really looks like. Remember, the cover story now aims to delve deeper into India's space ecosystem and the way it has highlighted the role of private sector companies in India's space sector and how these companies are now getting ready to even make bigger bets when it comes to space uh, opportunities right there. And Krishna is going to be explaining to us what is the essence of this cover story and what have we found out really. Krishna, tell us the way startups, private sector firms, how they have played a part thus far. We've all celebrated Chandrayaan and its success so far. And of course, there is more and more excitement about space missions going forward too. So how are these companies really exploring ways to play a bigger role when it comes to space missions now? Thank you, Sakshi. I think we need to understand a couple of things here. The fact is the numbers don't actually tell the full story. Because we're speaking for an industry which is just about $2 billion in terms of spend, which is about 16,000 crores. And contrast that, that to the fact that this accounts for just 2% of global space spend. So suddenly the number looks that, that much smaller. But the stories of the potential, it's not so much about where we are. It's, it's about where we will be or where we could be. Which is why you have the likes of the Tatars, Lastin Tubro, Gothraj, and all these guys looking to make a mark in it. Let's not forget that ISRO has a big game going on here. So this makes for a very interesting scenario where you have the largest conglomerates wanting to play here. You have somebody like ISRO and not to forget a host of startups. So this makes for a pretty interesting combination where you do have uh, entry barriers because a sound technical understanding is required. You do need the money to come in. But at the same time, the numbers don't tell the story. And that's what makes it that much more fascinating. So in every sense of the word, there's a story which is up in the air for, for all the right reasons. So and that's what makes that's what makes the future so exciting as far as space is concerned. Our story therefore attempts to bridge this particular gap in terms of where we are, where we'd like to be, and how we plan to get there. So that's broadly the essence of the stories actually. Okay, so uh, you know why don't you also help us understand the cover story? Also aims to really understand the ISRO model, the business model it works with as well. So just for the benefit of our larger audience, uh, it's an over fifty year old company. Um, you know how is it really proving to be one of the most successful incubators of private space firms? See, ISRO is a multi pronged model. For example, it works on projects that are typically long gestation in nature. Again, just to get, repeat what I said earlier, the revenues don't tell the truth story because you're speaking a huge amount of R&D that goes into it. We've seen that in the past projects, Chandran is no exception to that particular role. So when you look at it, they work on projects for often for several years and that may not come through when you look at the p account, for example. But at the same time, it becomes a perfect incubation center for a host of startups because the R&D that ISRO boasts of or that is a position of ISRO comes with its own IP and not something that other people don't have readily at their disposal. So the business model of ISRO needs to be looked at as a point where there's a tremendous amount of expertise that lies with ISRO, which is at the disposal of the startups wanting to be in the business and yet create an interesting entry barrier for itself. That's very interesting. So what's next? What can we really hope to understand from ISRO, uh, the kind of missions that are planned and what will that mean for the listed players? You know, we saw a, a flurry of, uh, uh, you know, comp listed companies showing that kind of a move coming out with statements that, you know, you, they played this crucial part in uh, Chandrayaan's mission. They uh, had this role to play, etc. What can we expect going forward from here now? Well, obviously, they're playing a the long-term game. There's there's a tremendous level of entry value because you're speaking of several regulations, several rounds of clearance before you actually before you actually get the go-ahead to work on a particular project. So they've got past that. So the market, I think, is actually taking into consideration the fact that you're not going to have a large number of players, and the players who come in will have a certain level of strategic and technical expertise. So that's what is going to work to their advantage. So it's it's not like it's not like an industry. It's not like, like an oligopoly, for example. It's not as if you have 20 players coming in that 21st comes apart. 
So there's going to be a case where sure. the process is completely filtered. You have just a selected number of players coming in. They work very closely with the likes of Isro, or they work with the likes of the Tatars or Larsen Tobro, who have very high quality standards anyway. So the market, taking into consideration, looking at this with a positive disposition, is a clear testimony to the fact that there's potential and only the chosen few will do well. Absolutely. And that we will continue to watch out for because this for sure is one of the stories that every Indian is very, very interested in and uh, tracking uh, for sure. Um, you know, we'll definitely, um, this uh, story will have a whole lot of insights for all the space enthusiasts out there and what the future could really mean for all the startups emerging and wanting to play a part as far as space missions are also concerned. But let's move on to see another important story uh, done by Anand Dadikari and that's uh, on uh, uh, clearly uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, which is one of the country's biggest and the best banks and how winds of change are really blowing in uh, the bank as well. We did see, uh, you know, how Uday Kotak really uh, stepped down as an MD and CEO of the firm and now uh, looking ahead what the bank is going to emerge into uh, from the traditional player to now becoming a tech-led financial powerhouse how is it that uh, uh, you know Kotak Mahindra Bank is going to be achieving all of that is something we'll try and understand so Anand uh, tell us uh, about the new Kotak Bank in the making and what is really changing and why is it really changing so thank you, Saksi. You know, the trigger for, you know, doing this story is the succession, you know, at the private bank. And this, you know, this succession is different, you know, from ICICI, SDFC, Access, and the Indusian Bank in the sense uh, that the founder, you know, still continues on the board, uh, you know, as a director. And he also holds a substantial, uh, you know, this 26% stake, uh, you know, in the bank. And if you look at the number, uh, you know, in the last four decades, uh, in the entire group, you know, he has built assets of around, you know, 6.89 lakh crore. And even the bank, if you see, the entire balance sheet size is around, you know, 4.5 lakh crore. And if you look at the market cap, uh, you know, it's the fourth largest, you know, bank in the country, uh, you know, after ICSA, SGFC and, uh, uh, you know, SBI. And the second, uh, you know, good thing about the bank, which I was looking at, is the two internal candidates, you know, the Santi Kambram and uh, KVS Manian uh, are the top contender and they both have considerable uh, in experience in the senior management team. Now coming to the new Kotak in the making, you know, like, you know, banking is all about, uh, you know, product and uh, services. So what more, you know, can be done there? But you have seen in the industry, you know, we have this five second, you know, personal loan, uh, you know, there are banks which are offering, you know, 30 minutes, uh, you know, car loan. And today almost all banks are offering, uh, you know, this instant account opening you know, via video, you know, KYC. So Uda Kotak, you know, in the last 18 months had set in motion uh, a strategy in place, uh, which is more like, you know, technology centric, uh, 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 you know, customer first kind of an organization. I mean, they are focusing more on the customer experience. And and, and for that, you know, they have had, uh, you know, global banking professionals, you know, from Amazon, you know, from Citibank, from Levers. So, so they have uh, a new team in place uh, you know, they have a head of technology, they have a head for, uh, you know, customer service, you know, they have a head for, new head for marketing and branding, and they have a new head for analytics, you know, especially the risk, you know, analytics. And they have a strategy like, you know, two in a box, you know, where a traditional or a seasoned banker works with the technology guy, you know, to uh, on a product, uh, you know. I mean, that's the way they are, you know, working. So like they say, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So let's see what, you know, comes out, you know, from their factory. Right. You know, but, uh, you know, from an investor's point of view, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank's stock price has actually been more or less stagnant in the last three years, if we see. What could be investors' big concerns right here? You know, I would call it, you know, succession blues. You know, if you see, uh, you know, in case of ICICI, SD, FC, and even Innocent Bank, uh, mm. you know, when the stars were left, you know, the price got, uh, you know, stagnated, uh, you know. Uh, look at the ICSA where you know Kamant you know converted the DFI into a bank and built a you know retail bank. SDFC, if you see, uh, you know Aitya Puri you know built the bank right from the scratch. Uh, you know Indusind Bank, you know when Ramesh Sopi came from Ibn Embro Bank, he completely turned around uh, you know this bit size you know Indusind Bank. And when they left, uh, you know there was some stagnation in the prices. You know, uh, so it's justified. You know when a new leader comes in, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. So I'm sure you know investors are. Uh, in a way, uh, you know, following a approach of wait and watch. But, uh, you know, if you look at the bank, yes, I mean, there are two, three senior guys who are leaving. Uh, 
uh, you know, Deepak Gupta, who is the interim or the MD CEO currently for this, uh, you know, three, four months. I mean, he'll leave, he'll leave by December. Uh, you know, Udo Kotak is out from the executive post. And even Goran Sa, you know, another whole time director, I mean, he left, uh, you know, last year. So you have a completely new team. You know, one is the succession part, like I told you, when it starts, you leave. And second, you have a new team in place. And third, you know, even the competition, you know, if you see uh, Geo Financial, I mean, you know, the way Geo is looking at uh, the entire bouquet of product is almost like a, a, a you know, universal bank, uh, you know, a strategy which the Kotak follows. So tomorrow they will get competition in the insurance, they will get competition on the AMC side, and even the lending, I mean, the merchant, MSME, consumer durable. So a lot of competition will also come. And they're also in the midst of this, uh, you know, technology tra transformation, which you know, everybody wants to see, you know, how the product will roll out. And uh, even on the business side, uh, uh, you know, I see some challenges uh, in the sense that, you know, if you see the unsecured book, and I was looking at some numbers for the last, you know, two years, uh, the unsecured book has gone up from 3% to around, you know, 10% and they want to take it to, you know, mid-teens. Uh, at the end of the day, it's unsecured. So now the new team, you know, they have to handle uh, this unsecured piece, which is rising uh, in, in the bank's portfolio. And second, you know, even the MSME and the other, you know, business loan and all, uh, I mean, these are also very high, you know, risky loans. So uh, we'll see, you know, how uh, things pan out. And today they get the highest price to, uh, you know, book ratio in the market. So there will be some correction in the price to book. But in terms of fundamental, I mean, the bank is very strong. Okay. Uh, so uh, definitely this should ease some of the concerns that uh, investors may have. And of course, wait and watch mode will continue till the time the new team really comes and uh, takes into account uh, the risky loans and the unsecured books and handles that in the best possible way as well. And that will eventually also reflect in the stock prices, hopefully. Um, let's now go across to uh, Nidhi uh, Singhal, who's uh, also written a very interesting story as far as the variable space in the small uh, category is concerned uh, for India because you know interestingly uh, when we compare smartphones to uh, maybe smart wearables uh, there is a completely different contrasting trend that she spotted uh, when we talk about smartphones in India uh, this market is dominated by Chinese players Korean players and there is no Indian brand in the top five but when we talk about the smart wearable space, the top four spots are actually taken in by the Indian brands. So what is the story here is something that we will try and understand from Nidhi. So Nidhi, help us understand what has really happened. How come Indian players are beating Chinese at their game and ruling the wearables industry in this country? Thank you, Sakshi. And I won't use a lot of numbers over here the way my colleagues used it. It's very simple. So... <laughs> In India, currently, everybody wants to own an Apple. There's a lot of aspiration in Indians. And when Apple launched its first smartwatch, which was the Apple Watch, everybody wanted to own one. But obviously, it was upwards of like 30, 40,000. And given the expensive price tag, not everybody could have owned it. Similarly, when we talk about headphones, earbuds, there were players in the Uber premium category. If we talk about audio, we can say there was Sony, there was Bose, there was JBL. But, and the other option consumers had was cheap Chinese options in the market where they were affordable, but there was no warranty. So if you got a cable, if you got a buds today, they might conk off tomorrow and there was no security that, okay, they'll last you for a year or so. So this is the gap which Indian players identified. These guys have been like Bolt, uh, Bolt Audio, the founders of these companies, they have been working in this space for some time. They spotted those gaps and then they decided that, okay, I, let's start a company which is somewhere in the middle. Like some of them say that we want to be the H&M of the wearable sector. We are not very expensive. We are not really very affordable, but we are there for a decent price span and we offer quality. So that was the first trigger. And then what they did was they also spotted the trends that Indians wanted. For instance, if you look at India, we are predominantly, we have been always a watch market. People love wearing uh, wrist watches. So now when Chinese brands, they were focusing on introducing fitness brands in India, what these guys did was they came up with affordable smartwatches. So something in the price range of three and a half thousand, four thousand. It was easier on the pockets. People got them and then they got quality also. And plus this was backed by a good service. So if I give you an example of Boat, uh, even today, even for a thousand rupee product, they are offering doorstep service. So if your watch goes bad, watch is still an expensive product, but yeah, if you're a thousand rupee birds or a cable goes back, 
um, you raise a complaint, they'll make sure somebody comes to your home, picks it up, takes it to the service center. They'll either repair it if it's possible. Otherwise, they'll simply replace it. Some other brands are offering a week's replacement time, a month's replacement time if you don't like the product. So that is how they managed to win the trust uh, of Indian consumers. And they have managed to secure 70% of the overall market share in India in the last like four, five years only. Sure, that's wonderful and very, very exciting as well. But you know, what I think a lot of people would want to now understand is that going forward, how is the demand placed? What if it really slows down and how will these companies survive? What is their game plan going forward? Right, you rightly pointed that out. So a lot of, in the last four, five years, a lot of the users were like first time buyers of smartwatches, earbuds. And even though affordable, people don't change their products that often. It, the replacement cycle could be anywhere from six months to two years, three years. So obviously, at, after a couple of years, we'll, we are going to see a slowdown in the demand of these products. And these guys are well aware of that. So what they've started doing is they've started to expand beyond the existing categories they are in. So noise and board, they have both come up with smart rings. So slightly expensive product, but it's like a advanced thing that you wear a ring instead of a watch that ring would track everything in terms of your steps, your blood pressure, your oxygen, everything would be just a ring that you're wearing 24 seven, that would do. Some of the other players, what they're doing is they're looking beyond India. So expanding in European markets, Middle East markets, where there is still demand for this category. And like uh, another thing that the companies are doing like Petron, they have their own manufacturing facility. So they are becoming contract manufacturers for others. So these guys have rightly spotted that, okay, where they could lose their leverage and they're expanding. They're thinking ahead of the curve, I would say. Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, and an interesting take over there. Uh, but there's another story that Krishna, you've written, and uh, that is on the other Wipro, you call it. Uh, now, you were discussing with me uh, before we began this uh, show, and you were sharing with me how not many people would know that uh, the famous soap brand, Santur, is actually made by Wipro. And this is not the traditional Wipro, but the Wipro consumer company, which has now quietly become a 10,000 crore rupee company. And you've also managed to speak to Azim Premji. And uh, tell us, what does he really have to say about the success of Wipro Consumer so far? What lies ahead for the company? There's a bit of a history, actually, because very few people would know this, especially, I mean, barring people who've tracked the company from very close uh, for many years now. This is the company where Azim Premji actually cut his teeth. There's a business from where he started his business journey. So people will go back in time and remember the Vanaspati part of the business, for example. And so Wipro really started off from that point. Santo came into being in the mid to late 80s and purely on the basis of sandalwood and uh, harping on the particular effects of sandalwood, they managed to grow the product. So if you look at it, it's largely a three or four state phenomenon, but they make over 2,500 crores of the revenue of the 10,000 crores just from Santo. There's not an easy business to be in. You're up against the likes of Hindustan Libra, you're up against the likes of uh, Godrej and all these guys, but they still managed to carve a very clear niche for themselves, went completely uh, strategically as far as the overseas buyers were concerned. They looked at markets like Southeast Asia, China in particular, and figured out a way to push the Wipro model to those parts of the world as well. To the extent that today, if you look at the overall revenue mix, it's almost evenly split between India and the foreign markets, not, not something which is very common. But the fact is, since the company is not listed, we obviously don't spend too much of attention in tracking the company because it's not... You know, therefore, you can't compare to the likes of a Godrej consumer or Mariko or a Daba. I mentioned these companies because they all fall pretty much in the same revenue bracket. The largest, of course, will be the likes of Adani Wilmer and Hindustan Lever and all of that. But to, and the interesting part again is they have a limited number of product categories. They work in fabric wash, they work in personal care, they have a bit of flow cleaning, but that's pretty much it. The big story that's actually which is unfurling is the desire to enter the snacking and the spices market, foods to be more particular. So they've actually made a couple of buyouts uh, in South India, where they're focusing clearly on the spices part of it. They'll be all set to launch, launch their snacking range by the end of this year. And who knows, it could just be the beginning of another large story to unfold. 
Absolutely, another large story to unfold in the FMCG business as well. Um, well, on that note, many thanks, Krishna, uh, Nidhi, Anand, for uh, being with us on the show and discussing all these wonderful insights. What a power-packed issue this is! Uh, you know, you get stories all from space to banking to FMCG to uh, technology. There's everything for every one of you out there. So do go out there and grab your copies. They are already on the stands. This is an issue that you. You shouldn't miss for sure in case you're interested in knowing what various uh, industries and sectors of the economy are facing with the leaders of the pack right there uh, many thanks to all of you for being with us yet again for all the viewers do stay tuned on to business today tv uh, to catch more news from the world of business and stock markets right ahead on your screens